yeah, that's a really good one for, for, for today, isn't it? We're going to sing of the goodness of God. Yeah, it took them two or three breaths to get going in it, but that's, that's all right. Hey, hey, what can we say? We're not perfect around here, but anyway, uh, that's great, and we, we love it, and the Lord bless. And I want to share with you today um, what I consider to be a, a message for, for today and for these times that we've been in. I've been in a series called The Hurt Locker, or I, we started in a series called The Hurt Locker, before all of this started with the coronavirus and so forth. And I had just done basically one, one message. And uh, there, were some, there were some different avenues that came out of my preparation and study of that message that I, I've really chosen to share with you uh, in these times where we're, uh, we're not able to be together at church. I, I would really love for us to be able to be together to share the remainder of that series. But, uh, but, but there have been, there's some issues that come out of uh, preparing and studying uh, the hurts that we have in our life and how the devil whispers in those times of hurt and tries to uh, interfere with our life and, and, and create tensions and strife and troubles and problems and issues in our, in our life. And so I, I want to talk to you today about winning the battle of your mind. Uh, there are three truths about the battles that we fight in life. Number one is, your mind is the battlefield of good and evil. Let me put that there for you. See, yeah, there we go. Your mind is the battlefield of good and evil. And I want to turn to a passage of Scripture in 2 Corinthians. This is 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 5. And, uh, and just look at this for just a, for just a moment. Uh, starting verse 3, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. So Paul's telling us, even though we don't, we're, even though we're walking in the flesh, we have fleshy bodies and we live in a fleshly world, and we walk in this fleshly world, even though we walk in this world, that there is an invisible world that's all around us that we obviously can't see and can't participate in, in our, with our fleshly bodies, but there's activity going on in this flesh, in this, in this uh, in, 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 invisible world all around us all the time that is not in the flesh. And God has equipped us to win battles in this invisible world, in this spirit realm, and, uh, but, but we do have to engage. We do have to show up. We're not going to just automatically win those battles. And in verse 4, uh, Paul says, look, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. Carnal just means of the flesh. So our weapons are not carnal. We have an enemy that sits right up here in our mind every, every day, every moment, whispering things into our mind that affect our lives in some tremendous ways, not not our physical bodies, but, but here in our mind. Our mind becomes the battlefield where these battles are fought, and the enemy sits right here. That's one reason why Jesus died on Golgotha. I don't know if you've thought of that. Golgotha means the place of the skull. And Jesus died to, uh, to set our minds free and, and to liberate us, uh, bring truth so that the lies of the devil would be, would be free from the lies of the devil. So anyway, we, we fight a war, and we don't fight it with fleshly weapons, according to 2 Corinthians 10. We fight it with weapons that are not carnal, but notice the next line, but mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds. A stronghold is a fortress that the devil uses to protect the place from which he uh, uh, tries to control our life. So a stronghold, you know, all of our life, if you've been around church very much, especially if you've been involved in any kind of spiritual warfare type issues or anything to do with, uh, with, with those type spiritual issues, you've heard two really big words used um, in connection with these kind of wars that we fight. One is strongholds and the other are bondages. Well, strongholds are a fortress that Satan erects in our mind. It, it's, a, it's, a, it's a mental strongholds mental fortress. And in this mental fortress, he hides himself in order to protect himself so that he can, can continue to influence our life. Strongholds are things like, you know, like, like fear and jealousy and 
anger and depression and lust and worry and doubt and disappointment. These are stronghold areas of our life, and these are the areas that Satan sets up in order to control our life. And then bondages, bondages are, could be defined as a house of thoughts. In other words, a group of thoughts that have all gathered together and, 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 and they live in the same house and they, they influence, influence the issues of our life. We all have issues, we all have problems, we all have sin, we all have things going on in our life, we all have issues, and every issue that we have is a thought issue. In other words, every issue that we have uh, begins with the way we think about things. Eating problems are thought issues. Drinking problems are thought issues. Drug problems are thought issues. Gambling problems are thought issues. Lust problems are thought issues. Every single bondage that we have in our life is a thought life. So if you change the thought, you change your life. So in our lives, when we come to the Lord, the devil has multiple strongholds in our life. When you get saved, Every single person has multiple strongholds in their life. In other words, we're not born saved. We're born lost, right? So we're born lost, and we don't come into a godly world, right? We come into a corrupt world, yes. So when we're, when we're born, we're not born saved, and we come into a corrupt, a corrupt world. So before we come to the Lord especially, and... And if we haven't done any battle like 2 Corinthians is talking about, we, we still have, as, even as Christians, Satan has set up some mental fortresses in our mind in order to keep us bound in the, in the old thinking and the old issues and the old life that, that we have. And whether the cause would be iniquities from your family, you know, those things your families believed and did and taught you and it bent you and twisted you as you were coming up. It might be from those kind of things. It might be from some carnality of your friends and your relationships. You know, those people that you hang around, those things that you do, those things that you say, those things that you participate in. The kind of life you live with friends that, you know, uh, aren't spiritual and they're carnal. You know, the strongholds may have come from some things like that. Or, or it might have just come... Came, uh, come out of the, uh, the sin in your own life. But the fact is that we have all developed some mental strongholds, and these strongholds that have been built into our life through disappointment or rejection or fear or hurt uh, create a fortress that make it hard for the truth of God to penetrate into our life. It makes, us hard, it, makes it hard to believe, for example, that God loves us. Satan has set up such a fortress against the fact that God loves us and cares about us and knows us and is personally involved in our life that it, it makes it very difficult for us to believe that God really does care about our life and that we can actually be on top and not on bottom, that we can be the lender and not the borrower, that we can be free from the scars and the reproach and the shame of our past. But Paul tells us that God has given us spiritual weapons to fight in a spiritual war, and those weapons are mighty, and with those weapons, we can pull down strongholds. Then in verse 5, he says, not only that, casting down arguments. Now, there is a, uh, there's a truth in the spirit life that I, I want to share with you just very quickly, and I want to I share with you from a passage of Scripture that might seem like an unlikely place, but I want to just show you how, um, how this happens in our life. These arguments, we pull down strongholds, those mental fortresses, but then there are arguments that the enemy throws into our life. And bondages get built around thought patterns and the way we think, and, and, and these bondages that have been built in bad times, once God begins to speak to our heart and our life, God begins to share the truth with us. Well, any time God begins to open the door and shed truth in our life, Satan casts an argument against the truth in order to keep us bound in these issues. And here it is in Genesis chapter 3. This is, of course, obviously the creation of man. In Genesis chapter 2, just to show you how close to the beginning this is, uh, the Lord has created man. The Lord looked at Adam and said, All right, Adam, you can eat of everything in the garden, but that tree that's in the midst of the garden, don't eat of that tree, because the, if you eat of that tree, uh, you're going to die. 
You got it? All right, yeah. The on, yeah, middle of the garden, right, yeah. Don't get on that one or else you're going to die. Well, then God looks at Adam and says, you know, it's not good for you to be alone. I need to create a, a help meet for you. I need to create someone like you for you. Uh, you're lonely. Uh, you need a mate. And, and of course, uh, he creates Eve. And right at the end of the chapter 2, uh, you have those famous quotes like, a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and they too should be one flesh, even though Adam and Eve didn't have a mother and father. D just a principle God's establishing. Now, the very first verse of the third chapter, God has, has created man in his own image and put two perfect people in a perfect paradise, in a perfect garden, with no issues, no problems, and, and no bents, and no iniquities, and nothing in their life, and given them a truth, and immediately... When God gives them the truth, the enemy moves to argue against the truth. Look at it. Now, the serpent was more cunning. I like to use the word stealthy. That pretty much, I think, describes the way the devil is, right? Yeah, you know what stealthy means. It means you can't see it, right? Well, think about it. I mean, even serpents today, and I know this one was a little different, but even serpents today, one of the problems that we have with snakes today is that uh, they disguise themselves. I mean, you know, they, they blend into the environment. They don't present themselves. Well, here's the, here's the serpent coming to Eve, and he's stealthy. He's not presenting himself the way he is. He's more cunning than any of the beasts of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said that you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the trees of the garden, but the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it. And then this might have been a part Adam added in. And don't you even touch it either, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. I mean, no sooner had God spoken truth to Eve, Adam and Eve, then the serpent brings an argument against that truth, against the Word of God. And what did it do for them? Uh, did it help them? Did it bless them? Did it make them, did it take them to a better place? No, this argument, you know what it did? It killed them. Right, yeah, because the moment they ate of the fruit, they did indeed begin the process of dying. Now, physically, they lived to be about 900 years old, which was a tremendous length of time even back then. Uh, and and uh, so physically, you know, they kept breathing and so forth, but spiritually, they died immediately. Uh, what does the book of Romans tell us about, about sin? Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and what? Come short of the glory of God. What is sin in its essence? Sin in its essence is the loss of the glory of God. Well, when did man lose the glory of God? When Adam and Eve ate of the fruit in the, in the midst of the garden. Before that, they were clothed with the glory of God. They were naked. They didn't have any shame. They were clothed with God's glory. When they ate of the fruit, they lost the glory of God. They saw themselves as naked. They fell from light to leaves, covered themselves with leaves, and tried to hide from God. Yeah, so Satan is a liar, and everything Satan says is a lie. Well, with the possibility of one thing, one, when Satan looks at you and says, you're messed up, <laughs> he's telling the truth about that. But other than that, you know, everything, that, that's why we need a Savior, by the way. <laughs> that's good news. But, but everything Satan, he's the father of lies, and he brings argument against the truth of God. So verse 5 says, not only is the, are the weapons that God gives us, God, when we, in this spirit realm that's not of the flesh, we can't fight battles in the flesh. The battle is in our mind, good and evil. Satan, Satan sets up a headquarters up here, and he begins to whisper. He begins to, he begins to try to influence, and he begins to bring arguments against the things of God. He tries to set up strongholds in our mind and create bondages in our life through the hurt and the loss and the rejection and the anxiety and the strife and the stress and all the issues that happen in our life. He's constantly whispering lies and half-truths to us in order to, to affect our lives and keep us from knowing God and serving God. And, and, and Paul says God has given us some weapons that are powerful and can handle the attack and the assaults of the enemy. But those weapons are not carnal weapons. Those weapons are not fleshly weapons. They're not like guns and knives and bombs and bullets and so forth. 
They are, they're spiritual weapons. And these weapons are so powerful that these weapons can actually go into our mind and pull down strongholds. Satan's sitting in his fortress thinking he's safe and secure, thinking he's got everything taken care of and we're walking in the wrong direction. And, and, and these weapons of God can reach into our minds and pull down those fortresses that he's hiding in, can wipe away those bondages that are in our life can cast down the arguments that Satan brings against the Word of God. Every time the truth hits our life, Satan brings an argument against the truth of God. And the weapons of God can pull down arguments. And then it says, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Those high things in life, Satan has only one purpose in life. And that one purpose in life is to keep us from knowing God. Satan wants us to lose our relationship, to not know God, to not have any walk with God, to be filled with fear and lust and worry and doubt and depression and discouragement and jealousy and envy and strife and anger and unforgiveness and all of those things. And it doesn't matter to him. It doesn't make any difference. He doesn't care which one of those things stops us in our track. He just, doesn't, he, just, he just wants to put some high thing into our mind that will occupy our mind and become the focus of our mind to keep us from knowing God and reading the Bible and praying and coming to church and, 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 and focusing on some good thing, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought, every thought, every thought. If you... It, if you don't bring your thought under control, your thought's going to control you. Bringing every thought, the Scripture says, into, the, into, into captivity to the obedience of Christ. This word captivity in the Greek literally means at spear point. Yeah, to take something by force. When you capture, when you capture something... You, you, you take it by force and you bring it into subjection. And literally in the day of Jesus, that was by spear point. And you take control. So what is, what, what, what's the scripture saying to us here about the thoughts and the things that go on in, a, in our mind? It's saying to us that, that, that we have to take control of our thoughts. Now listen, you are the gatekeeper of your brain. You decide what comes into you. You decide what stays in you. You decide what you think about. And you decide what you accept. My eyes are a gate into my mind. My ears are a gate into my mind. My mouth is a gate into my mind. My senses, my feelings, all gates into our brains. And when a thought comes in, according to this verse, when a thought comes into, in, uh, an argument begins in my brain against what God says. And Satan begins to try to establish an argument, a stronghold in, in my life to keep me from knowing and serving God. And Paul says when that happens, we are to take out our spear and put it against the neck of that thought and say to that thought, you're not going to take me captive. I'm going to take you captive. Because God has given us the power to come against all of the thoughts and to bring them into captivity, it says, to the obedience of Christ. Obedience is hupaka'e, which doesn't mean anything for you, but, but I want you to know that literally it means to listen under. So we bring this thought captive. We get our spear point and we put it at the neck of that thought and we bring that thought that Satan has just introduced or that good thought, or bad thought, and we bring it over here, and we, and we, and we, according to the rest of that verse, we, we, uh, we sit it at the feet of Christ, and we force that thought to listen to what Christ says about it. In other words, everything that comes into my mind has to be subject to the Word of God and what God says about these things. And it has to sit under Jesus and listen to what Jesus says about it. And if Jesus says it can stay, it can stay. And if He says it's got to go, then it's got to go. So the battle of our mind begins with an understanding. The truth is 
This is where the battle of good and evil is fought in our life. It's not fought out here with other people and other issues in, in, in this physical world that we live in. Oh, I'm not saying that we don't have problems with people because we all do know we have problems with people. and They can be a real pain and we can have issues going on, but they're not, they're not what we battle against. If we find ourselves battling against other people, we need to stop a second and realize this person is not my problem. It's that enemy that is sitting in my brain and telling me all of these lies and issues and arguments and false concepts and half-truths about these things, and I can fight this battle in my mind because God has given me weapons to do that. Number two, truth number two, all right? The Word of God is a spiritual weapon. You know, I said God has given us the weapons. Uh, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, is what? Corinthians said, right? They're not fleshly. They're not of the world. So what kind of weapons do we have? Well, the Word of God is a spiritual weapon. Let me give you, this is from Ephesians chapter 6. In Ephesians 6, the Apostle Paul's writing and he says, uh, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. You might be interested, that word wiles is the Greek word methodia, from which we get our English word, obviously, method. So what is this saying? It's saying that Satan has methods. Satan has a plan. He, he, he's not haphazard. He, he's not, he, you know, he's, he's not uh, helter-skelter, haphazard. No, he has wiles. He has a method to come against us. And we're going to have to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and against powers and against the rulers of, this, uh, of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. That's the battlefield we face. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to, to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Have you ever had an evil day? Yeah, where it just seems like everything that Satan had stored up to come against you with, that's the day it just seems to happen to pour out. Not just one little thing, but two or three or four. I mean, it just seems like one right after another, and you're just overwhelmed with these things. That's an evil day. So we're all going to have evil days, right? Yeah. You may be in one right now. I don't know. But we all have evil days. And, 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 and Ephesians is saying, all right, God is going to give us weapons that we're going to be able to stand against spiritual darkness and spiritual wickedness and evil. We're going to be able to pull down stronghold, cast down arguments, tear down high places that the enemy has set up in our mind. And, and, and these weapons are going to work even on evil days. Stand, here he goes, here they come. Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth. Now he's talking about a Roman soldier here. And he's probably thinking about a, a Roman soldier when he says to us, all right, first, first, first things first. All right, get your belt and, 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 and get your belt around your waist. Well, the reason why is because it is on that belt that a scabbard hangs. You may not have heard that word in a long time. A holster, a pouch for an eye, for a sword. It's called a scabbard, yeah. You got a scabbard hanging on your on your belt. When you when when the Roman soldier put his belt on, there was a there was a there was a scabbard hanging for 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 his sword on his side. So you put your you put your belt on. Now I, I don't want to get too graphic or image or use too strong an image for this, but but just just so you'll you'll know that there is a a, a reason for saying this, for saying put on your belt of truth first. Think about this area of your body. All right. No, I know you've all gained weight, but, but just think about it anyway. Think about this area of your body right in here. This is where the belt of truth is, right? All right, what is this area of the body used for? This area of our body has two purposes, right? The first purpose is reproduction, right? This is where all of it takes place. The second is elimination. So the purpose of this area of our body is reproduction and elimination. What, what, what would this be saying to us about the truth of God? It, wouldn't it be saying to us that, that 
the, the Word of God, which is the sword that goes in the scabbard, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, that if we are bound by the Word of God, then we are going to reproduce truth and we're going to eliminate error in our life. And if we're not bound up by the, by the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, then we're going to reproduce error and eliminate truth. So the first weapon, God says, is we, we, you stand having, your, having girded your waist with the truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts. These are the fiery missiles that Satan fires at us. These lies, these half-truths, these accusations, these arguments, this false way of thinking. He fires them at our life, these fiery missiles. And God says, you've got a shield of faith with which you can catch all of those fiery missiles of thoughts that Satan fires at you all the time. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Now, I, I want you to look at that last line because I, I know a lot of times when, when I quote this or other pastors quote this, you might be thinking that, the, that whenever we get to which is the Word of God, that that's an interpretation. In other words... That's somebody saying, well, what the sword of the Spirit means is it means it's the Word of God. But I just want to show you that that's not an interpretation. That is actually the Word. That's what the Scripture says. That's what God says it is. That what we have is we have a sword of the Spirit, and that sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. Now, the only offensive weapon we have in our arsenal against the enemy the only offensive weapon to win the battle for your mind is the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Every other weapon that God lists in Ephesians chapter 6 is a defensive weapon. We have a, we have a, we have a, a, a girdle of truth. We have our feet shod with preparation. We got some shoes on. So, we, so when we step on sharp things or harmful things, we, we can walk. We have a breastplate of righteousness. We have a helmet of salvation. And we have a, a, a shield to quench fiery darts. All of those are offensive weapons. Now, how many of you are aware? I know many of you are athletes and you played in all types of sports and all of those kind of things. How many of you are aware that if you're on a team that never plays any offense, you're never going to win the game. Oh, I know a lot of time defensive, defenses score and blah, blah, and you can create all, all kind of arguments, but you know what I'm saying. I'm saying if your offense never takes the field, you're not going to win the game. Your defense is going to wear out. I don't care how good a defense you have. They can't play the whole game. The offense has to come on the field and has to move and has to score and, and make some points at times, right? Well, the same thing is true in the spirit realm. We have great defensive weapons, but God says, I've given you an offensive weapon, and you use that offensive weapon because that offensive weapon is a very powerful weapon I've given you to come against the enemy. The weapons of God are mighty to the pulling down of strongholds, the casting down of arguments, and the tearing down of high places in our life. When, 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 the, when the devil came to Jesus in Matthew chapter 4, he came against Jesus with thoughts. The battle of the ages was fought between God and Satan in the wilderness. And it wasn't fought with bombs, and it wasn't fought with guns, and it wasn't fought with knives, and it wasn't fought with bullets, or anything like that. The battle was fought with the ultimate weapon, words. And Satan came to Jesus with words, with half-truths, with lies. If you're hungry, he said. Jesus had been there 40 days and 40 nights. Satan said, if you're hungry, command that these stones be made bread. Hey, if you really want to impress these people with how great you are, just throw yourself off the top of this temple. 
and they'll be so impressed, they will just worship you. You will be the greatest. Hey, come up here and let me show you something. You see the kingdoms of the world out there? Hey, if you will just fall down and worship me, I will give you all of those kingdoms out there that you see. Words, lies, half truths. And you know what Jesus did? Now, what could Jesus have done? Well, Jesus could have done anything he wanted to do, right? Because he's Jesus. But we couldn't do anything like that because we're not Jesus. So you know what Jesus did? Jesus did the same thing that he's telling us we can do in 2 Corinthians 10 and in Ephesians 6. He's saying, guys, I left you the same weapons that I used to defeat the devil. You know what Jesus used to defeat the devil? Three verses out of Deuteronomy. Now, I know Deuteronomy is a great book, and all of the books of the Bible are great books, and they're filled with great truth. But I would just venture to say that you're probably not going to just leisurely read through the book of Deuteronomy. The book of Deuteronomy is a book of the law and the second numbering and all of those kind of things. And it's not just, I mean, that's not on the top of everybody's popularity list. So Jesus takes three obscure verses out of an obscure book and destroys Satan right there in the wilderness. When Satan said, hey, look, take, tell the, you're hungry, tell these stones to be made bread. Jesus looked at him and here's what Jesus said, the battle's over. And he said that by saying these words, it is written. When he said it is written, that was the end of the battle, I'm going to tell you. That was, that, that was all it was. That was the end of the issue. He said, command these stones be made bread. And Jesus says, all right, I'm going to pull my sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Jesus said, it is written. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Whew. Whew. Well, the devil jumps back. He says, well, you know, you need to impress these people with who you are. They don't believe in you. They, they, but if you, I, hey, if you'll just get up there and do something really extreme and really super, they will just believe in you. And the angels, look, 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 you know God has given the angels charge. They're not going to let you stump your toe, much less fall off of there and get splattered on the, on the, on the rocks down here. And Jesus took that sword of the Spirit out of that scabbard. Shh, and Jesus says, it is written, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And he stabbed him, he cut him, he, he fought him. Satan, he's, he's damaged, but he's, he's game, you know. He does a little Texas two steps, jumps back up there one more time and says, well, look at all these kingdoms out here. You know, they all belong to me, right? I'm the king of the world. Yeah, that's what he thought. I'm the king of the world. I'll give you all these kingdoms if you'll just fall down and worship me. And Jesus said, it is written, one more time, <laughs> uh, thou shalt serve the Lord thy God and him only shalt thou serve. <laughs> And he stabbed him, and the Bible says in Matthew 4, and immediately the devil left him. And the angels of the Lord came and ministered to him. What is that? That's the battle that we face for our mind. That is the battle that we face in life. These are the weapons that God gives us to fight the battle. And this battle that God calls us to, to, to fight in is not against people. And when we find ourselves battling against people, and we have people problems, we need to remember that we're not battling against flesh and blood and that the problem is always a spiritual problem. It's never a flesh. It's a spiritual issue and put on the whole armor of God. How do you put on the helmet of salvation? I know I've preached this all my life, and I've been, you know, I've yelled at people just like I'm doing today at you. 
And, and poor Pastor Tanya's out here. She's the only sinner we got in the congregation out here today. Well, Chris is back in the sound room and Joe, so they, they would count, I guess. But, but I've yelled this all, all my life. Put on the helmet of salvation. How do you put on the helmet of salvation? You think like a saved person. You think like a person who belongs to God. When you think like a person who belongs to God, you're putting the helmet of salvation. You are saved. You have salvation. Salvation is a helmet that will protect your mind, protect your head, keep you from being attacked uh, uh, upside your head. What does that mean? It means, look, man, you've got to think like a saved person. Somebody that knows the Lord and believes the Lord and loves the Lord. And when you do that, you, that, that's putting the helmet of salvation on. And then the breastplate of righteousness, yeah, it covers this, all this, all these vital organs in here. Yeah. Well, it's the blood of Jesus that saves my soul. It's the blood of Jesus that changes my life. And I have a breastplate of righteousness. How do I put on the breastplate of righteousness? What does it even mean to be righteous? It means to live right, right? Righteous means be right. Right thinking, right living, right talking, right acting, right attitude. Yeah, it means be right. So putting on the breastplate of righteousness means live right. Think like a saved person and live out the life that you know God intends for you to live. Put on the breastplate of righteousness so that Satan can't attack all of these vital organs that are, that are here in this area. And then... Gird your waist with truth. Put on the belt of truth. Decide that you're going to walk in truth. That you're going to bind yourself up with truth. That you're going to quit wasting your time and wasting your energy and wasting your effort with all this silly frivolity that the world can offer us. And I'm going to look at the truth and I'm going to bind myself with the truth and I'm going to decide that I'm going to reproduce truth and eliminate error in my life. Put on the, the, the girdle of truth. And then have my sh feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. The gospel is the gospel of peace. Peace how? Peace between you and God. Peace between men and God. When I go and share the gospel, what am I trying to do? I'm trying to bring God and man together. I'm trying to reconcile. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to bring them together and make peace between God and man. Decide I'm going to live my life for a higher purpose than making a buck and spending every nickel of it. Live your life to propagate the gospel of Jesus around the world. That's putting on. That's putting on the armor of God. Now, there's one other truth that I'd like to share with you, and I think I'm going to have to do it next week. And this is a real truth. This is a real, this is a real thing. And it's very important, very vital. And uh, I'll share that with you next week. I hope this has blessed you and hope the Lord has blessed you in this life. Remember, remember the battle, this right here, this is where the battle of good and evil goes on, right here. And God has given you weapons and it begins with the Word of God. Listen, I, I just happen to have my Bible on this stand this morning. You know why this Bible's so thick? Because God has lots to say. He has something to say about everything in this world, everything in my life. So we're going to look at what God says, and, and we'll see how to... The third truth um, is, a, is a, a very powerful part of this, and uh, we'll look at that next week. Let me, let me pray for you right now, all right? <music>